And we are back. We are back. I'm your host, Jake Fox. This is Black Tower Radio. We are broadcasting live on 1040 AM, 92.1 FM, WYSL in Rochester, New York. Also on worldnewsradio.today. That's worldnewsradio.today. And we are joined here by our regular guest, Kit O'Connell of Kit O'Connell. Dot com. Kit is a freelance journalist who also writes for Act Out and the Ministry of Hemp. Um, we've been having Kit on, as you know, for quite some time, and he uh, he always has some really super interesting stories that he's muck raked. <laughs> And we got him now to talk about some of those stories. Well, welcome back to the show, Kit. Thank you. It's always it's always fun to come on and talk to you. So we're going to lead off here with college student builds sustainable doghouse from versatile hempcrete. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I've never heard of hempcrete. I mean, excuse my my lack of awareness here, but hempcrete. It sounds like something that's like super durable, but like ugly looking. And I don't know what it looks like at all. But um, so, what is this all about, Kit? That's uh, that's not uh, that's not totally wrong. It is definitely, it, it, you know, it's not the most attractive uh, exterior thing in its raw form. Although, um, uh, one thing when you go look at the project uh, that I covered, uh, that project, this doghouse that got built out of hemp creek. Uh, due to time and budget constraints, the student that made it, she wasn't able to uh, do that. There's like a finish that you put on the outside of it, and that would definitely make it look a little bit more attractive. Um, but hempcrete is super versatile. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, basically, just to give a little background, I found out I just kind of lucked upon this story. It was being covered on a local news station. But this student named Lee Humphreys, uh, she's um, out of North Carolina, and... Uh, you know, she's in a, uh, she just graduated with a sustainable technologies degree from uh, Cape Fear Community College. And her sort of final project for that degree was to create this uh, doghouse out of hempcrete. Uh, and I think it's a really, it's just a fascinating project because it shows it's really simple. Uh, she's obviously a very talented student, but she was working on it on clearly basically a shoestring budget. And she was able to do this. So hempcrete is made from, there's really just three ingredients. Um, uh, what, what are called hemp shivs or hemp cores. It's basically sort of the kind of woody inner core of a hemp stalk. So, of course, industrial hemp is still, you know, it's the cannabis plant, but it's, you know, varieties of it that are grown uh, to emphasize their, their fiber rather than the content of THC, and they really don't usually have any THC or, or almost none in them. Um, but they have these, these strong fibrous cores that are really useful for a lot. Uh, and in this case, these, these cores get chopped up, uh, and then they get mixed with uh, a lime-based binder and water. And that's really all there is. Uh, and for commercial applications, there's a commercial lime binder that if you look up hempcrete, you'll find they recommend the brands that you can use, and it's available pretty widely uh, as just, you know, for any sort of building project that needs a binder. And so you, take these, you get these hemp shivs, uh, and the lime binder and water, and you mix them together, and it creates, yeah, it's very durable. Uh, it's uh, extremely reflective and insulating, which means, you know, it's, it's warm in the w- in winter and cooling in the summer. Um, uh, previously, another writer from Ministry of Hemp uh, looked at, uh, they, they, they calculated that people in Alaska could save, like, hundreds of dollars a year if they used hempcrete as a real, you know, core insulation in their home. Um, you know, they have sometimes heating bills with thousands of dollars over their winters, and it could slice them in half uh, just by, you know, switching out some more conventional materials for hempcrete. But it's also, it's, you know, it's obviously sustainable, and it doesn't have any uh, volatile chemicals in it. This isn't something I even really knew about until I started researching this uh, story, but I guess a lot of the building materials we use in our homes, especially when in new homes, they outgas all these toxic chemicals. Uh, after we're done building them for a while. And this is not a case of hempcrete. It's totally clean on that. And I guess it's also really breathable, which means it's very mold-resistant. 
Uh, it lets moisture through, but, you know, not so much that your home obviously gets flooded, but enough that your home uh, is breathing, which I guess is really great for, for preventing mold and that kind of thing. Um, and it's, just, it's so cool that this student, you know, she was able to, uh, you know, with not even the best equipment, create this really great and functional doghouse that proves that this is a great material. Uh, but people are already using it for a lot. I just read about um, a project. Uh, I have to look real quick and find out where it is. But um, basically, they're taking this 1970s, you know, standard home like so many of us live in or rent, you know, uh, and they're taking out all the old wall materials and they're replacing them with hempcrete. So it's going to be more insulated and uh, like a healthier home for the occupants. Uh, so there's a lot of really interesting stuff being done. Of course, the issue right now is how you get the hempcrete, right? It's not legal in every state yet, and even the states where they are starting to grow hemp again, uh, which is spreading really rapidly, uh, it's a lot of the states are just beginning sort of with test programs, and so it may not be simple to get these hemp sheds uh, that you need. Uh, but hopefully that's changing. In terms of price, what's the difference between conventional concrete and, and hempcrete? Uh, I think it's probably, I, I don't know those exact figures in front of me. I would guess it's probably more expensive at this point. Um, at, at this point, pretty much any application of hemp is, is unfortunately, a little bit more expensive up front uh, just because of the fact that, you know, most of the hemp that we have to get is, is often imported from other countries. Uh, in the case of Lee Humphrey's uh, project, uh, she she's in North Carolina where they just started growing hemp again, and so she... Uh, got her hemp shivs brought in from Virginia, and, you know, I want to say she spent, this is a ballpark, she has the exact figures if you look up the video that we linked to that she created, if you look up on my website, uh, but she, at the end she posts, like, all her costs, uh, but it was somewhere around $400, $500 to make this, uh, you know, in the, just the shivs cost around three, 400 bucks to make this dollhouse, and that's not including any of the other stuff. Uh, and the lime binder can also be a bit of a, a pricey item, apparently, too. She ended up kind of making her own, but that's obviously not really appropriate for a building that people are going to live in. Next up is the Democrats' resistance summer is really resistance to change, and this has been a frequent theme on this show. The resistance is not a resistance well, in, in, from the Democratic Party. It's not a resistance at all. Um, just corralling people into their uh, their their political party, which really has nothing new to say and, and doesn't want to say anything new. Um, I don't, I'm I'm assuming uh, you uh, you you agree with what I'm saying because of the headline of this. Uh, what can you go deeper into that? <laughs> <laughs> I do agree with what you're saying, and and you know I. I say that with some regret, not because I'm a huge booster of the Democrats, it's just because I wish we had a really great, viable alternative in this country. And while uh, I'm not going to uh, be mad at anybody that votes green, I don't think that they're yet the effective alternative that we might like to see, you know? And so they were kind of, we're left with the, you know, the Republicans who, who are just disturbing us more and more every day, where the Democrats are so ineffective, and then, you know, all these alternatives that aren't really powerful yet. Um, but as far as this Resistance Summer, um, Resistance Summer is a summer-long project at the Democratic Party and Move On and some of their other, you know, close uh, astroturf groups are, are involved in. Uh, and it's meant to be, you know, to sort of build on this feeling of that so many people are feeling right now. And, and this is a genuine feeling that people are having, right? You know, uh, we have this administration that, you know, uh, is creating just, it feels like new horrors every day, whether they're rolling back climate change stuff or, you know, threatening, you know, queer rights or, or whatever it is, you know, immigrants, the undocumented, letting ICE just go wild in our country. It's, you know, every day there's something new and, and terrible. And, and a lot of people who've never been involved in activism want to get involved in activism. And, and one issue, I think, with activism in general, especially after things like Occupy have gone away, is that it's very hard to get involved. You know, if I'm somebody who's never been an activist before, I might not know where to go if I want to start volunteering or helping out for a cause. 
Um, and there's this sort of general, you know, there was this, this, this idea of resistance that was so common. We had the Women's March, and we had, uh, you know, those, those airport protests, which I found quite inspiring. Um, but yeah, a lot of that doesn't seem like we're seeing as much of that. There certainly have been some marches and rallies. But, yeah, so the Democrats have kind of come in to try to capitalize on this desire for resistance and entry into activism. Um, and it's a three-part program. Uh, which is, you know, starting with getting people together for backyard barbecues. Uh, and then uh, that was supposed to happen last month for the most part. Uh, this month they had people doing voter registration drives. The people, I guess, that got together at those barbecues are, are meant to get back together. And then next month the idea is that the Congress will be coming back in session shortly in the fall, and so we hope that legislators will hold, be holding town hall meetings and they're asking people to go to those town hall meetings and ask for what they, 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 you know, what they need from their legislators. And on the surface, you know, I, I don't want to say that this is the worst plan ever. They're certainly simple. And, I, and as I said in my article, which I collaborated on with uh, Eleanor Goldfield from ACT OUT, um, you know, this isn't a terrible uh, idea to get people together for backyard barbecues. Now, I'd rather that they were maybe inviting experienced activist groups and communities to come to those barbecues and reach out to those people and say, hey, here's how you can help us. But that's kind of where we get into this, that the Democrats have a history of taking resistance movements that do happen, popular movements like Occupy or the example I, that we used in this article uh, in, in most detail was the Wisconsin uprising that happened at the beginning of 2011. Um, and for your listeners that don't know, Scott Walker, the governor, was threatening uh, union rights. He did, a, he did eventually pass the laws that, that, that uh, you know, got rid of uh, a lot of the rights that unions had there. But it turned into this large-scale popular protest where at one point 100,000 people were inside and around the Wisconsin Capitol protesting for union rights, but also, you know, better education, just, you know, uh, that are jobs, you know, the whole list of, of intersecting demands that so many of us are feeling these days, that, you know, our dissatisfaction with the way things are. It really, just like with groups like Occupy, it brought all these people together. Um, and but what ended up happening was the Democrats came in and basically pressured the unions, really threatened the unions by saying that they would withdraw support for the unions if the unions didn't fall in line with the Democrats. And the Democrats' plan was that they were going to hold a recall election for Scott Walker. And what ended up happening was that election, because of how those things are, there's a whole process of petitions and all that, it took up all the momentum, that movement that was demanding so many things, more than just a better governor, but really a better government. And it became all about getting Scott Walker out. And that process of doing that took about a year, a year and a half. The momentum dwindled. The support dwindled. The National Democratic Party abandoned the efforts once it became clear it was going to be a tough fight, while the Republicans started throwing money, and not just the Republicans, but the Koch brothers, threw millions of dollars into this recall election, which Scott Walker basically easily won. Um, and we can see that pattern in the 2016 election uh, in a lot of ways, and we can see that pattern with things like this resistance summer, where there is this widespread and growing dissatisfaction that has led to some very dramatic street protests and now people are looking for ways to follow through on it. And the Democrats want to step in and take up that momentum. And I think it's really important that as, you know, act, more experienced activists and community organizers try to get involved and offer people other ways of getting, you know, involved in activism, direct action, agitating for change, that don't just involve or don't at all involve the Democrats. Because we've seen the history of this. Um, you know, with Occupy, again, we saw... Uh, they first tried to sort of take over the momentum of this thing they called the 99% summer, I think is what it was called. But Occupy, in most places, was actually pretty resistant to control by the Democratic Party. And so what we saw was just brutal crackdowns, and some of the most brutal ones in places like, you know, Oakland, New York, and even Austin, Texas, where I'm from, those are all places with Democratic mayors. And they just came down hard, of course, with federal help from the Obama administration on Occupy, when it became clear that they couldn't take Occupy and use it the way that the Republicans used the Tea Party. And you contrast that with a conservative place like Lubbock, Texas, one of the most conservative places. They had tense up people occupying into, into like 
the summer of 2012, if not after, they had people occupying tents there in a Republican town. So, you know, not that, again, I'm not praising either party here, but the Democrats have this history, and we need to be aware of it as we're building something new uh, in response to this state of emergency that we're in. Yeah, up here, actually, um, Occupy did a whole lot of whole lot of damage uh, in a good way. Um, it, the Buffalo Occupy movement was one of the most um, impactful uh, Occupy encampments uh, in the country. Uh, Oakland and, and Buffalo, I think, were the two most impactful. Uh, the Buffalo Occupy movement got the city to divest over, I believe, $40 million from J.P. Morgan. It was... It oh, was, wow. Yeah, That's was, amazing. That's wonderful. Yeah. It, yeah. It, we have, we have a history in, in upstate New York of activism, um, impactful activism. You know, it's the home of Susan B. Anthony, Frederick Douglass. Um, yeah, we uh, we do it large up here, Kit. So, uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know how anyone can stomach supporting either party. I really don't. When I talk to a party loyalist of either party, I think you're ignoring a whole lot of horrible stuff. And you know what? I think that's a contemptible thing to do. I mean, what do you, what do you think? I mean, I would support almost anybody that would offer a genuine alternative, including the Democrats, if they really pulled it together. But at this point, it's like, it's become like, you know, this is a cliche reference to make, but, you know, uh, you know, the peanuts, you know, with, with, with poor Linus and his football, you know, just constantly, uh, or sorry, to Charlie Brown and his football, just constantly being pulled away. You know, it's like, you know, it, every time the Democrats say, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to support these, re- these, these progressive causes, but we can see already that they're, they're pushing to, to, to run to the right in 2018. You know, we have to appeal to the Donald Trump voters. And it's like, no, we have to appeal to the millions of people who did not vote and as you and I have talked about before, and I know you've talked about before at Greg Palace, we've got to figure out how to get those people able to vote, uh, the ones that can't. Yeah, I think a lot of the people that don't vote, don't vote due to our system. Um, I mean, I'm talking at the uh, electoral presidential level. Um, a lot of people don't vote during presidential cycles because they don't feel that their vote will count. You know, in New York, a whole lot of Republicans just don't come out. And, you know, in Nebraska, a whole lot of Democrats or whatever, whatever red state you can name, mm-hmm, they just mm-hmm. don't come out and they don't vote for anybody at all. You know, that's that's a big flaw in our system, I feel. It, it is a big flaw in our system. Uh, you know, uh, up until the 2016 election, I had been researching, you know, reforms to things like the Electoral College and experts were telling me, you know, there's a lot of bipartisan support for uh, uh, abolishing the Electoral College, but I don't know if that's still true, you know, uh, seven, eight months after the election when the Electoral College was so good to the Republicans this time around. Uh, it has been, you know, uh, it, it, I, it's hard for me to believe that they'd want to change that system. But the people need to agitate for changing the system. If we want to have an electoral democracy, so we need to have one that's functional. It needs to be more representative. It needs to it needs to have people power versus just wealth power. And yeah, we need to fix stuff like the electoral college and the interstate cross check and there's all these other ways. It's, it's hard to blame anybody that looks at our election and is like, why should I bother? I don't really have a great answer for that, especially if you live in one of the states like you're talking about. Kid O'Connell. Go to kidoconnell.com to find all of Kit's work. Freelance journalist Kit O'Connell doing God's work. I'm not a religious man, but, you know, I'd I, I just like to point that out. Thank you very much, Kit, for coming on the show again. It's always a pleasure. I'll talk to you soon. All right. And next up is a regular guest, Turd Ferguson of TFMetalsReport.com. Turd Ferguson of TFMetalsReport.com with our Economics and Precious Metals Report. So stay tuned for that. We will be right back with Turd Ferguson of TFMetalsReport.com with some economics and geopolitic talk. So stay right there. <laughs> 